adjunct associate professor in the radiology department of University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Liu is the co-director of the Laboratory for Re Perception, Action, and Cognition at Penn State. Her research interests span a wide range of applications in computer vision and pattern recognition, computer graphics, medical image analysis, and robotics. Today, she's going to present her work on symmetry group-based learning for regularity discovery. Let's welcome. Thanks, May. Um, so I'm going to walk around a little bit, but I just want to have a control time. All right. Um, so before everything, acknowledgement. Uh, this work I'm going to talk about actually not just by me, so that there's lots of people, maybe some I, I even forgot, uh, and also supported by various uh, sponsors. Uh, also, uh, there are some really great mentors I have worked with. Okay, start with uh, where are the symmetries. I often uh, be asked this kind of question, in particular in computer vision community, because nobody sees symmetry, nothing is perfect. Uh, so just to give you an example, since I just came back from NIPS, uh, usually I, that's the only places I go is where the conferences are. Uh, so for me, uh, this is just things just jumping out. Things like this, you do see regularities, symmetries, um, this is an ECCV, although usually this appear in man-made structures, but you can actually also observe in things that's uh, natural. In particular, I mean, in this uh, Marseille, they have some kind of uh, very geogra special geographic uh, kind of phenomenon. Uh, as you can see, we can immediately pick up something repeating, something straight and layered, etc. Uh, this is another. CVPR, even in this kind of wild place, you do see structures. Uh, well, this is ACCV once again, just all kinds of modern and uh, traditional structures. Um, well, anyway, I think that's enough to go back. Um, I would like to point out is that sometimes uh, the regularity appear in places maybe we, we don't even see in our daily lives, such that it's like this. Uh, I don't know anyone want to make a wild guess what this is. L louder. Fish skin, all right. This is actually not too far. It's actually um, human muscle, uh, but magnified many, many times. And this? What's that? Teeth, somebody's teeth. Uh, this, the, the, I guess the hint is it's not a steak on the grill, um, but someone just came out back from the cruise, right? So this is actually uh, iguana skin. Well, and this is actually tremendously regular. Um, some of you familiar with fish might know. This actually is the eggs. Uh, this is just something, uh, random stuff I pick up from the internet. Anyways. Uh, so indeed, if you look, uh, this kind of regularity or symmetry is indeed ubiquitous. You can actually see them all over the place. Very small things like the gene to very large things. This actually is a pattern of a dying star when at the end of the, I guess, die, death, it's actually release all the energies and it actually appears in some kind of regularity, regular form. And this is also another interesting discovery published in Nature, which is observing the firing field of certain grill in uh, uh, certain cells in the um, rat's brain, and turns out it's some kind of uh, hexagonal structure. So what is symmetry anyways? I think this uh, quote from this very well-known book uh, kind of summarizes it. So I think initially we may have some kind of very intuitive uh, feeling some kind of balance, some kind of proportion, uh, correspondence, and ultimately like, come to the math that is the automorphism of um, of invariance. So it's really capturing what is invariant under a certain type of transformation, and that uh, is what we usually call symmetry, symmetry or symmetry groups. Uh, just very quickly, the symmetry algebraically you basically apply a transformation to some kind of set and then you ultimately get the set back. But it is set-wise invariant, not necessarily point-wise invariant. 
And why this is relevant, so I want to come right down to why it's relevant to computer science, in particular computer graphics. Uh, this is one example that I personally experienced, so I just want to use this as a motivation. Uh, some of you, maybe all, all of you have heard texture synthesize. This is a very hot topic in computer graphics. Uh, in the, I guess, less than 10 years, in the past less than 10 years, it had like a very big, uh, progress has been made. But before that, usually it's just doing procedural uh, texture synthesis. But in 2001 C-Graph, for example, this paper shown, given input like this, just like, like a little image, and going through the algorithm can generate output like this, and this one as well. Uh, this one we're familiar with is like flowers. This one I'm not so familiar, but this is supposedly to be some type of cheese uh, look like. But they look pretty believable, right? I mean, um, but before this time, for example, textures like this will look uh, like that at the output. So obviously this kind of texture I picked particularly has certain uh, properties that you and I, human in particular, able to recognize and very quickly uh, to, to pick the problems if there is any. And in this paper, image quilting, this is actually one of the slides they used, you can see they showed input like this, and then you get all the other algorithm output, and then this is the output from the proposed uh, algorithm. So just take a closer look at the input and output now. Uh, everybody should love this. Of course, this is a big progress from what could be done before that. I just want you to tell me uh, how, how do you like it. If you have a wall um, for your house, would you like a, a wall like that? So this is the input. And this is the output. Locally, it's, it's, it's great. And all the details is well, well captured, realistically looking. Anything? <laughs> oh, right, over there. OK. Not stable. Why is not stable? Uh, when this was published, I think my daughter was like, I don't know, two, three, four. And she was counting this way. She said, big, small, big, small, big, small, big, small. And this big, small, big, small, big, small, small, so that's not good. Uh, so for a child's eyes, for example, this is just like a regularity, really. That's what she's enumerating. And that's exactly what you are saying here. So um, this kind of output, indeed, would make, um, I mean, of course, from we, we, we think of this from a very practical point of view, but indeed, just as uh, faithful to the input, that's already somewhat violate this uh, uh, expectation, and I, uh, I would really want to thank, <laughs> actually, um, the author here who did this also for me in particular. So this is a problem, and also even this other um, paper, Wang Tile, is elegant algorithm, very fast. However, even from this little input, you can see the regularities about uh, to approximate orthogonal directions. However, in the output, you can see indeed they are lined up this way, but this direction is all kind of messed up. Uh, another kind of regularity people usually don't pay much attention to is geometrically they can be deformed, but this color-wise actually there is very regular alteration. This is almost like a green thing with a, a yellow dot versus another big yellow dot. And this alternating whenever you take this uh, quadruple uh, unit of them. And of course none of the uh, Synthesized algorithm would really acknowledge this kind of regularity at this, at, at least during um, those uh, before 2004. So what's the problem computationally? This kind of algorithm actually is a kind of a um, statistical pro uh, statistical algorithm have this assumption of local Markov property. Basically saying if I started with a little patch and I found um, in the original image, some neighborhood that is similar to my neighbor, to my boundaries, then I just pick that patch and kind of quilt, right? That's what this image quilting is about, to so start to put patch by patch together. And then the boundaries, because they are similar, so I can do some little tricks, use dynamic programming such that they really look nice. Uh, that's basically what it, this algorithm is doing. That's why it's so intuitive, quick, um, easy to code. Pick that patch. Is that some um, standard or principled way you can say what's the size, shape of that patch? Out of uh, real, like 
justification. They basically just say, okay, let's just take a square patch, and the size of the patch is user de determined. So then, as a user, you can, for different kind of texture, you basically you adjust that and see what you output like, and you try a few of them, and one of them look good, so you put them in the paper. And that's what it's doing. But the fundamental question is, what is this patch supposed to be? And that actually affects the output in a very crucial way. Later on, this is some of the results from our work. I just want to show you here to see, to, 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 show, to demonstrate that indeed the, that patch, that the smallest unit that perhaps we call sometimes text on, sometimes textile, text cell, um, that's indeed very different in, in size, shape, and orientation. Um, so what's really happening here is lacking, at least those kind of Markov property-based algorithms, is lacking the understanding of this, this non-local property. Although each patch is a local thing, but it's really determined by some kind of uh, global property or structural property of the texture. Um, so there are several myths about this texture synthesis thing. One of the things is people think if you choose that window extremely big, then you don't have this problem, right? I mean, because regularity, if you choose that too small, so you, you kind of cut off your information, but if you choose the big one, then you won't have that problem. Uh, but when we demonstrate this, when uh, the authors demonstrate, even in the ICCV paper in 99, uh, you indeed see the window bigger and they look more regular. But look carefully. The original um, input has all this same sized um, bricks in, in this case. Uh, but in the output, you can see this alternating with small, big, small, big. But the reason is picking that because when, whenever you have an interlock texture, you have to cut it somewhere. Whenever you cut, you always have a small brick at the end. And since you're doing local things, sometimes you just include that um, as one of your neighbors. You can't exclude that. Wherever, it doesn't matter you make this big, small, you always have this phenomenon. Because when you look locally, that little part half or little one quarter of that brick always be part of your input. Um, and of course, this is repeated here on this col color image as well. Um, so whose regularity we're repeating? That's the, the question. And I think even for um, this uh, graph cut synthesized algorithm, they basically take the whole input. You can't be bigger than your input, and that remains to have this problem of regularity understanding. And second one is, oh, maybe just we don't have to worry about this generating this uh, 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 tiles, well, the unit differently. Perhaps we just tile them. And that's, of course, also not the same. When you um, think carefully about how you should put things together versus you just simple tiling. So naive tiling will give you results that's boring, that's no variance. Uh, uh, and obviously, you can tell the difference. And the, the third one is people just don't care, right? I mean, what do you do use this for? Oh, in video games, that's so fast, no, people don't even pay attention to what, whatever on the wall. Um, so we did some kind of, uh, kind of specific study, user study, basically, to, first of all, to evaluate how many of this, what we call uh, near regular texture, I, I will define uh, more formally. Uh, but those kind of texture have some texture. Uh, has some structure, how the algorithms do on this, and ultimately actually use human users to evaluate this. We published work um, at CVPR 2006. This actually um, have um, one of you sitting here as a co-author as well, contributed to this work. Basically, we compare four different kind of algorithms and let the user to, to do the comparison. And the results statistically definitely telling us very clearly people do know the difference between the algorithm that's faithful to the regularity versus those general purpose texture uh, synthesized algorithms. So how to do things right? And I would argue that ultimately we need understanding, not just uh, local properties and uh, uh, usually statistical signals. We also need, we, we actually have to, understand regularity, and that will lead to symmetry and lead to symmetry groups, and perhaps more precisely will be a marriage between symmetry group theory and the statistics theory. Um, step back 
people look at texture in different ways. So I would like to present them in terms of their regularity. On the one end, you have all these perfect things like um, mathematicians usually deal with, like wallpaper patterns. And then on the other, this is a very typical kind of pattern, in particular in early graphics research, they have all these so-called noise models. They have, I mean, all kinds of mathematical uh, and generative uh, procedures to generate those noise. But there are things in between. There are lots of things in between. Actually, most things you see when you just take arbitrary image, even around here, you can see the seating. And even your, your carpet has regularity there. Um, basically, the, the arrangement here also. It, it's really not uh, all extremes. Most things reside in the middle. And in particular, the part that's near the regular, most regular form, it's actually quite um, uh, common around us, in particular in man-made or even non-man-made uh, cases. So we propose the idea of near regular texture with understanding that some things you see, there is an undeniable structure, regularity there, but of course it's never be presented perfectly. It always has this noise or some kind of sensor error, systematic or random. And that, however, has been has not been treated uh, properly computationally in our view. And that's why this kind of thing we observed in texture synthesized results uh, uh, existed. So we started by proposing, let's just see, for those geometric, reg somewhat regular, but uh, kind of photometric wise or color wise, I mean, in this case, each brick will be different. This kind of texture, what kind of things we, we can do to fix this? So the first thing we would say, got to end the regularity. And the regularity in this case in particular is a kind of underlying lattice. And this actually related to the translational symmetry group of the pattern. And if, for whatever, using whatever method, we can recognize that, and immediately you can basically build a lattice structure. And then, uh, so this would be the analysis step in a synthesis uh, task. That is, you then can sample this input texture in a very particular way that is you basically take the basic unit and perhaps for the synthesized purpose, you just expand that a little bit. Uh, uh, so you, you can basically sample two sets of tiles, if you will, um, from the original data, but they are overlapping in a certain way. And then during the uh, synthesized step, you say, say, okay, so I don't know uh, where what this uh, texture is supposed to be, but I do know they should follow some structure and first lay out the structure, then trying to put the tiles back. This, of course, can be as big as possible. You can randomly pick one, then start to random pick from the other ones too. But of course, you can set some kind of um, similarity metric and then try to minimize the differences. And this way, the latter structure guarantees the regularity, geometrically, spatially at least, but on the appearance-wise, you still see the variance because you're randomly choosing from your uh, data. So this is the one of the results, and then if we put the input in there, as you can see, they do not really jumping out at you. Uh, this is just another result, just to show um, it indeed follow the regularities of the input. So when the texture is somewhat deviating from regularity, now I'm going to show a very short video. I hope the sound works. Just to give you an idea now, things are going to deform. Near regular textures are common but difficult to synthesize. We demonstrate methods to faithfully synthesize arbitrary amounts of near regular texture, such as this brick photo, and manipulate the regularity in the synthesized texture. One such manipulation is texture replacement. Imagine that you have a photo of a textured surface, but your director wants another texture on that surface. By capturing the departure of this texture from its regular origin, we can extract the geometric and lighting deformations and apply those to any other texture without knowledge of 3D scene geometry. In this real world example, we replace the original brick texture of this building with a number of different textures while preserving the lighting, shadowing, and apparent curvature of the original surface. By using sequential video frames for the replacement, we can achieve a video texture replacement. Okay, so just can't resist to show this. You really can put anything on it after you understand whatever the um, deformation is of the original texture. 
So what are we really um, seeing here? There are two things lead to this kind of um, algorithm. First is this. So we take a picture, um, and uh, suppose that this is some kind of near regular texture. Instead of looking at this as is, uh, we actually can see this simply a snapshot of something in migration, or is a dynamic process. So we can see this actually originally coming from something completely regular, uh, like regular in the sense of mathematicians' uh, wallpaper patterns, but going through, has gone through already some kind of deformation, both geometrically and photometrically. And if we understand this deformation, we actually can manipulate this, uh, this uh, towards even more irregular end. So even go to, I, I think, completely become a, a, a pile of things on the ground, maybe, if I mean, we, we choose to do that. Um, so one insight of this work is that, indeed, we can treat all this, uh, this non-regular uh, stuff as has a regular origin. And the second thing is the non-regularity or the deformation from, from regular regularity is actually happening in all kinds of dimensions, modalities and uh, dimensions. So it can happen geometrically in the lighting and uh, in other things. This is only shown three here, but this is definitely not the limit. So conceptually, then, we can express this basic saying, OK, I don't care what kind of things in the world, even something far away from regularity, I can still express it as a mapping from something purely regular uh, through what we call deformation field to be whatever it looks like now. And in this specific work we did as C-graph, so basically we decompose this deformation into the lighting, the geometry, as well as the color. So basically this becomes a simple uh, functional uh, composition. So here I'm going through very quickly this algorithm that we uh, kind of proposed to synthesize this deformed version. Input data, supposedly for using whatever method we found underlying lattice, then this underlying lattice becomes uh, basically a, a 2D lattice with delta x, delta y at each uh, lattice point. Okay, then we can do two things. First, we can straighten the lattice, right? So to its nearest regular form, that's actually you can find a closed form solution and that can be easily done. And the second thing we can do, we turn this delta x, delta y. Instead of treating them as geometry transformation functionally, we actually treat them as a descriptor of color. So now your deformation field become a piece of color texture. And in this case, we're specifically using HSV color space. So this is your deformation field. Now we got two pieces of texture. One is a color texture, which may not be, has all those regularities that we have talked about. Um, and there is existing algorithm to synthesize that. And then there is this purely regular texture that we have straightened out the, uh, from the original uh, deformed texture. Then this one, we can easily just tile it up, right? Because it's regular, we really understand it very well. And this one, we can just synthesize it using local property. Now we do this du dual pro um, property of this, basically switch this back to its functional side because each color indeed has a physical meaning of moving things around. Then we're basically mapping that into your regular version. So this is completely followed our basic understanding and the reasoning about indeed that we impose the deformation on the original data such that we actually have this synthesized results in this case, particularly, geometrically follow what input tell us supposed to follow uh, if this synthesized process indeed preserved the statistical variation of the original texture. And it preserved the neighborhood, in a sense, this color alteration that has originally observed in the input data. And we can also start to modify the gain to make it more irregular or less irregular. In any case, so this is one of the brick walls we did, and once again, play the trick of putting the input there. Did you see it? Okay, take the input out and put the input there. So the same kind of idea applied here, where we actually use uh, some kind of PCA approach to figure out what's the mean tile and then do deviations on that. 
anyway. And another thing we do is we take a picture, then we can immediately, like the little movie show, separating the deformation, the pair of deformation field. One's geometry, one's lighting. Then we basically turn the geometry into color texture and turn the lighting into yet another texture. Then we can synthesize this geometry as we wish using existing algorithm. The question here is what's the color supposed to be? And as we all know, especially those of you who have uh, computer vision background, that uh, the geometry and the, and the shading um, field have some kind of corresponding property. So here we basically use this idea about image analogy um, to do deformation field analogy. So the same kind of principle applied, we can generate yet another uh, shading texture, then using this larger pair, we can apply this to any uh, texture. So this is one. As you can see, this is a completely fabricated texture with reasonable lighting and geometry coupled together. Um, when you see this, you, you, you definitely know this is synthesized because nobody built a wall like that. Um, so furthermore, we can actually with this kind of idea of uh, near regularity, we can actually quantify this. Basically, we can define a geometric deformation measure, so geometry regularity. Basically, that's the complete can be obtained from the deformation of the lattice. Uh, once again, this is a closed form solution. You basically find out what the nearest regular form is, and you just compute all this distance and sum them up together. And once you have such a lattice, like in here, you basically cut your texture into these little pieces. Now you basically have a, a tile, um, a pile of your tiles, and then you can observe in the corresponding pixel and see how they vary. Right? If you think you have a complete regular wallpaper pattern, then corresponding pixel should all have the same color. Then your standard deviation along that column vector will be zero and that deviation from zero would indicate how much the appearance variance that you got. Uh, so now you put a 2D space of regularity quantification and you can put all your textures that you have distributed in this space and then you can further use this as a quantitative measure of texture synthesis results. So instead of simply like another person look at your result and say, oh, look good, look not good, you actually can be more objective at least following this kind of um, measurement and place a dot in this space and see how far away you are from the input texture. And one of the undergrad students actually from CMU took this even further. He actually contacted the original author of the Nature paper and got all their rat's brain firing field uh, data and used this quantification and clustered two types of cells from those grid cells. Uh, data and, and publish a paper on proposing there are two types of them and one is setting up the regularity of the room because they let the rats run free in the room and the other one setting the orientation. Um, so what I've talked so far is really address this recognition of regularity and it being deviating from that and treat that as the real world patterns. Model that, model the real world pattern as a deviation. So as Frank Zappa said, we better know what's that norm we're deviating from. So briefly, I just want to mention about what's the math behind all this. Uh, if it's too boring, just raise your hand and I will just fast forward. So back from deviation, what we're looking at here, and when I use the regularity very loosely, I actually have a implied um, very formal and uh, well-defined uh, concept in there. What symmetry or symmetry group is about is really all kinds of uh, transformation that keep whatever set you're looking at set by invariant. And if you collect all the symmetries together, they actually has an uh, algebraic group structure. And this is basically called symmetry group of whatever the object you're looking at. And the types of symmetry groups in Euclidean space in particular that we're concerned with right now it has a hierarchical structure from the, to the, the complete Euclidean uh, group to the identity group. And in the middle, you got all these other groups as subgroups relation. And in particular, those uh, red ones are interesting. Th those are symmetry groups in 2D. And in particular, it's interesting for computer science, science I think, is it's, um, it's attractive to very efficient algorithms. 
this kind of mathematical categorization of symmetry is complete, it's, it's proven to be complete, and there are only finite number of those, and is a constant number for, for some of these varieties, and that constant is small. For example, in 2D space, we got basically four types of symmetry groups or symmetry patterns. In particular, I was uh, really um, excited when I learned this when I was a student, although I couldn't really use this because I was doing robotics. Um, but the thing is, if you take nothing out of this talk, I think this may be something you can remember and uh, tell people about at a party or something. So basically, about 100 years ago, the question was raised and answered that was for all kinds of periodic patterns in any n-dimensional Euclidean space, if we use, I mean this of course is mathematical, mathematician's way of looking at peri periodicity uh, and the geometry is that use groups, use symmetry groups that characterize different types of periodic patterns. The question is, there are finite number of those or there are infinite number of those different periodic patterns? And the answer is they're only finite. And for different kinds of n, there are different kinds of, uh, this number of finiteness is different. For example, 1D, this is a, a customer, uh, follow the tradition, it's called the crystallographic groups. 1D means patterns that are repeating along one dimension. There are only seven of those, so those are called the seven uh, freeze patterns, seven freeze groups. And these are, they are, if you just, without loose of generality, just put them horizontally, then these are different kinds of, different types of symmetries they associate with, and uh, this is the interrelation between those seven in terms of their symmetry groups. They are not a flat structure, they actually have hierarchies. And 2D, that's even more relevant to the texture I'm talking about, there are only 17 different types. So this is all mathematically proven. Um, and the underlying lattice, that's one of the things actually I use quite a bit uh, in my work with my students, is doesn't matter how this, uh, wallpaper pattern is being deformed, the underlying structure is always quadrilateral. So degree four graph, that's all you need. The inner structure also in particular interesting that has all this from simple translation only, so that's obviously a subgroup of everybody, to very complicated internally translation, ro ro uh, rotation, reflection, glide reflection, and all types of rotation centers. So in inter between them, yet again, it's not a flat structure. It has very interesting interrelationship from the purely translation to these two are the most largest supergroup of others, and, but they do not contain each other. So this is basically a graphical interpretation of what Hoxeter has presented in his book. So what we have done with this, just a, a recap uh, in kind of um, time order. Do we start to saying, okay, how about we just write algorithm and give me any image. Let's just tell, uh, let the algorithm tell you which group it is because there are 17 choices. Then we did that. Uh, so this, although uh, the image it doesn't have to be perfect, but geometrically, spatially, it's regu is somewhat regular. Therefore, the lattice is really a periodic lattice. And there we basically use the autocorrelation, trying to find peaks, trying to find a, a very stable way to avoid the wrong peaks. So this is some of the results we published. Um, then there are some interesting things based on math and also very interesting for human perception or machine perception. That is, once you find this lattice, the lattice actually can be float um, on the pattern. Wherever it's anchored down, you can cut a, a tile. Then you just use this uh, translation, basically this is the generator of the translation subgroup, then you can generate the whole pattern. Regardless of this tile or that tile, they actually generate the same pattern. However, indeed this tile says something to us, right? We feel more natural, and why is that? Mathematically speaking, if we look at this one simple unit, this is the internal structure of one of the wallpaper patterns, all these diamonds indicating two-fold rotational symmetry. And looking at one of them, we can ask the mathematical question, what is the orbit of this? That means, is there any element in the symmetry group that can transform this guy to any other two-fold rotation centers? And the, the, the answer is no, there isn't any. So it has its own orbit. However, those four yellow ones, they actually can be transformed into each other. And yet again, those blue ones can. Uh, very simply, just use a reflection, those two guys will be. 
Then, given this pattern with this symmetry group, then we can now um, locate the so-called motifs, which has highest order of rotational symmetry center, uh, systematically and in a principled way and exhaustively. And there they are. So basically, we, from reasoning, we know there are only three types. There's no more, no less. And we can actually write the algorithm and find them out. And we actually do this for all the 17 groups. And even more interestingly, I think more, uh, the, in particular, once again, computer vision people would be able to appreciate this is you never rarely look at the pattern face on. You perhaps look this way, that way. I mean, whenever I take a picture, it's always some kind of oblique view of the original pattern. And if we use an affine camera model, so that basically means your pattern going through affine deformation. And the question is, we already know from mathematicians there are only 17 choices, right? And the affine deformation keeps parallel line parallel, therefore it remains to be a repeated pattern, therefore it has to have uh, a s one of the 17 uh, wallpaper groups as its symmetry group. Then the question is, which one is it? Um, so this is a mathematical formalization, basically your group going through a conjugation and your pattern going through a transformation. And here is one thing I thought was quite uh, useful for m most of us who are interested in patterns. That is, you can see this three pattern, red, green, and this facet from MIT, some building. Um, they all start with this kind of symmetry group, P2. However, if you allow any kind of transformation to be applied to that pattern, the most symmetrical form the red one can go to is P6M. I will show you where it is. And the green is P4M, but this guy can not go any further than PMM. What does that mean? PMM is way in the middle, and those two guys are way up here. Okay, so this is really what we use. This symmetry is really a hierarchy of regularity. That is, this has much higher regularity than others. And the punch line here is, it's already built into your pattern once the pattern is being designed, regardless how you deform it. So that's why I call this potential symmetry. That is, I don't care how you look at this pattern. If I allow all kinds of affine transformation, the potential is there or not there. It's encoded. It's like the DNA of that pattern already. And this is very useful computationally. That basically tell you is you don't have to store a huge database of this pattern. One is enough. And there is a canonical form. OK. All kinds of applications we can do. First of all, for vision people, again, once you got a pattern, you always say, oh, but it's perspective distorted. I can't do anything about it. Of course, we can always use an algorithm to rectify back to up to affine. Now, under affine, we can do this kind of things. Buildings, in particular, these are very repeated pattern and, and everything repeating and uh, uh, appearing like repeatedly can cause ambiguity. But once, just like what I said before, you come back to its canonical form, and then you're pretty much able to tell what group it is and how you measure the smallest unit, the motif, then you can determine uniquely whether they are really indeed the same pattern or not. Text replacement, so understanding the texture, uh, actually provide a mean to do s automatic segmentation of the texture and do fun things like this. You basically can... Um, separate the geometry from the lighting. Um, another thing we didn't do, which got criticized quite a bit, was in our secret paper, we didn't say we automatically extract the lattice when the lattice is totally deformed. But that almost was purposely done. We want to demonstrate, indeed, once you know the lattice, you can do lots of amazing things with it. Therefore, finding lattice is important. So subsequently, we published work on automatically giving an image to find the lattice. Uh, using a uh, spectral method actually the first time. This is uh, basically treating uh, discovery of regularity as a higher order correspondence problem to building, basically finding the generators, uh, but building locally and gradually spread out the whole image. Um, then we, f oh yeah, and this is application actually, uh, collaboration with Georgia Tech. So, in Georgia Tech, they have this database full of both 2D and 3D. So 2D images of the city and the 3D models of the city. And the question is, the 
images can be taken actually from, I don't know, 40 years collection of different images. And then some, actually some Im uh, buildings just disappeared, and some new buildings come up. And they really want to match uh, images taken from different orientation with the 3D model. The urban environment is highly re repetitive, as we have seen already. So using our method of finding lattice first, then finding this um, motifs of the lattice, and using the skewed symmetry group idea of rectify into its original uh, canonical form, then the mapping, matching between from 2D to 2D image of different views and the 2D image to 3D models becomes extremely um, feasible. And so this has been done in this paper, and then match back to the 3D world, and then they also have the ground truth, so they estimated what the arrow cost through this matching, and it's actually quite amazing, in particular, the accuracy on the um, orientation. So are currently using this idea further to do segmentation. So basically, finding lattice from urban scenes, you, you basically can divide your image into different kind of lattice, different um, uh, parts of the image will be segmented automatically. 3D re reconstruction, super resolution, because once you have a repeated image, basically you have lots of windows, and they are the same thing, and you want to make someone look better, then you got lots of copies of it. Um, and compression, actually that's one of the fundamental things. Symmetry can really help. Another thing we do fun things with this is uh, to defensing. So give an image for those of us have kids, you usually shot, uh, you stay at baseball, you can't really on the baseball field, so you, you took a picture outside, but you do want to see your kids, or whatever, tigers, um, then you can just erase the lattice. So this basically, there's a learning process there to use repeatability as a cue to learn a foreground, background classifier, then use in painting. Um, then our recent work, this is uh, this year, we further developed this idea of uh, deformable uh, lattice uh, extraction. Uh, I would, given time, not say too much, but the basic idea is random uh, markup random field and using this mean shift algorithm, uh, but a very efficient version uh, in belief propagation. Just to show some of the results, indeed it works. Uh, here's a movie. So this one we actually tested on quite a bit of images quantitatively because we have undergrads just to label all the ground truth and then we actually have algorithm to compare the output from the um, human and output from the algorithm and then compare the difference in every pixel, uh, every uh, pixel. So like this is a very challenging image actually. The regularity only appears on the fence and it's a black and white image and there's quite a, a clutter behind it that algorithm can still reliably finding the um, repeated pattern. Basically, that's the fence. Okay, let's move on. Um, so these are just quantitative results. We have the original data set that we used in the 2006 paper at ECCV, and then we have this new type of data that all the see-through structures, and then we have a big set from actually Georgia Tech, which all this uh, urban scene structures. And the quantitative results, as you can see, SS means both success, uh, first failed FS, and the second success. By the way, the newer version never failed uh, in the case that the first earlier version succeeded, so that's not one of the cases. But they do both fail on certain very small number of the uh, images where the repeatability actually is higher frequency than what it really is. Um, so these are lots more examples. And also, we have done this quantitatively because, like I said, we actually deal with real, I mean, real data and with real uh, ground truth. So you can see the newer version of the algorithm is double the accuracy, while the speed up is like 10 times faster. Another direction we go is dynamic. That means videos. Uh, this is yet another thing in computer vision, tracking. Whenever you're tracking something that's repeating, it's like this whole piece of cloth repeating, it's just really hard if, because, I mean, when people do octave, uh, local approach, um, Lucas, Canadi, whatever, uh, very traditional classic methods, it, you basically, you're looking for something 
um, locally similar, similar across frames. And in this example, for example, this is water, disturbed water, but the pattern is under the water. So all this kind of physical, uh, it's very hard to model actually, motion blur highlights, etc., uh, causing tremendous computational challenges as well as occlusion, and this one's all the pokey dots all over the place. So the idea here is just to rephrase is, so when we did, well, when we do perfect regular texture, that means the tile is really all over the place the same. But when you do near regular, basically saying the tile is a function of um, location. But now we're doing dynamic near regular texture, so basically it means that's not only a function of the location, but also a function of time. Therefore, once again, mark up random field, but now we just also has add another dimension, that's the time. And treating this as a spring model and both following with um, the appearance uh, model as well as this kind of underlying structural model. So instead of following each of this little piece, we're actually tracking a structure. And that's where the robustness come into play. There's just some comparison with um, Optical Flow and Lucas Kanadi. So this is um, how we deal with occlusion. So this is, uh, once again, inferring from the appearance model. And whenever it's being considered occluded, it will have a black uh, texel. Okay, also deal with tracking humans. This, I don't know why they walk this way, but uh, this a piece from DAPA. Um, this is actually quite challenging because of the lighting and all the shadows, and not everybody's head look the same either. And quantitative comparison with the multi-target tracking work done by other people. So this is the kind of thing we can do once again, just like uh, in the CIGRAP paper, uh, except we're doing this on video, and we keep a temporal consistency. So original data and all this texture being replaced. So you get the same kind of physical effects, except different color. And this, once again, from a movie, um, we do something to the texture. Uh, yeah, then, so you can do fun things like that. Well, maybe I should have put Google there or something. In any case, um, so on this, we basically can further right now dealing with even more challenging things than in Penn State, where everybody talking about football games. So I only watch the band because they are nice near texture, and you can have all these interesting patterns happening. The geometry, uh, the topology can be changed as well, so you can start to merge and uh, separate those uh, different patterns. This is just for the fun of it, uh, but I think I'll show the coach just to see if they can use this for some uh, validation, evaluation purposes. Um, then also people from medical field also start interesting, because these are like human hearts, and you do this gated thing. So they have a data like this. They um, purposely put a lattice on the heart, and then they see how the lattice deform, and we actually can track that. So we just got a grant last year about crowd um, tracking, I guess, and then I just want to point out this, this once again, the spectrum again. So from that end, we really start from very regular form up to here to the near regular but dynamic, then to the more adaptive local topology form, and then to some kind of crowd, well, loosely, they may locally or temporarily form certain uh, letter structure to thousands of millions of people. Hopefully, we can still help. But for me, this is just a disturbed piece of uh, wallpaper. Anyway, I think I'm running out of time. Well, a few minutes. Um, this not just appear like the things that you think is useful. Sometimes you use things that may be um, somewhat unexpected. So this is a piece of, well, video about uh, people walking. And then if you do something very simple, just do correlation of different frames along the time axis. So this horizontal and the vertical is just uh, frames in time sequence. Then if you do correlation, if something happening on the video is happen to do some kind of repeated thing, then you basically get a piece of wallpaper. Then immediately you use all the computational tools about finding letters, finding groups, finding the motifs, uh, same thing. Then you basically got a piece of tile of this guy walking, and it has certain symmetry, and that actually says something about that guy's motion. Because if you do this to a dog, and the dog symmetry will be like this. At the time when I did this, actually I didn't have a dog. And I didn't realize when dog runs, 
when they run real fast, they don't do it bilaterally. Maybe horse, the same thing. So kind of gait is one leg always before, uh, before the other leg. So they actually run like this. So the symmetry actually reflected in this tile. And you can see the human bilateral walking and um, dog running actually indeed differ in terms of symmetry or regularity. So at a time at CMU, we have this database, mobile database, everybody's walking on it. Actually, I don't know. You are not on it, how many, right? I'm not on it either. But um, then we actually can do fun things with it, with very simple things. You, once you can get a silhouette, you can just drop it on the two directions, X and Y. And immediately, you just get a histogram, and that's just one line, one gray line, right? So when the high is a brighter color, brighter intensity, and then when it's low, it's darker. So each frame is one line, and since you have videos, you have lots of frames, so then you form this lines of uh, patterns. And that actually, if the person does something repeated, repeated, and this is a freeze pattern. And interesting thing is when we observe avatar, avatar's freeze pattern from different orientation, they actually show different symmetry groups. So this also uh, true, not just in artificial situation, also in real video. Basically, you see you have a fixed camera, you have this guy walking around, and you're basically equivalent to watching this guy from different angles. Then, uh, at a different street segment, you can actually see a freeze pattern that varies. And we also compare it with male, female, and this computer model. Turns out, if we have the six cameras set up, they look from different um, kind of height and different angle. And when you look at this pattern, although they are different subjects, they actually have the same symmetry group, regardless male, female, or whatever, if they are looked from the same angle. So using this as a cue, we actually propose to use symmetry group freeze pattern in particular as a way to estimate from where I'm looking at this person. And the first thing is we got to determine which symmetry group it is. So here we come actually extend the group idea beyond just discrete groups, but as a continuous feature. Because pattern, we can actually measure distance. We can define a well-defined distance. Um, for each given pattern, it's not necessarily a perfect freeze pattern. I mean, nev nobody walking around say, I'm, I'm going to walk symmetry group number three or something. So it always has irregularity, but that's nice, because then you can measure distance between that pattern versus all the seven. Uh, but the thing is, has to be very careful to do model selection here because they are not a flat structure. Remember, originally I have pointed out they have a hierarchical structure. So we actually use the Anatani's geometric AIC trying to do the make uh, to make the right, right decision about which group is most similar to. In any case, that's being used actually in application estimate orientation, and further on to use this data to do uh, human identification from gates and got reasonable results. In any case, so this group idea basically carried through from the texture, from street, just trying to identify what pattern is which group, to an analyze of under different um, deformation what the pattern happens, to texture synthesize, that's actually where I started with, and to the gait analysis. And um, some more stuff we have been doing. Um, okay, I will start with this one. The bad news is we actually have done uh, quantitative evaluation to, so symmetry detection, this is a big piece of work in computer vision. The effort started when, the, when I trace back, it's like 40 years ago. The first paper actually even predates computer vision, but it's an algorithm to find symmetry. In any case, we actually did a survey, uh, not just a survey, we actually did a quantitative evaluation of existing algorithm and given a set of images and how good are they compared with each other. And this is the bad news. And if you can see this, okay, let me see this more carefully. Basically, on real image with multiple symmetries, the best algorithm can do is about that kind of accuracy, 32. So these are two different algorithms, and 26. But if you count the false positives, and that's almost complete, this one basically wiped out all your false, all your true positives, and this one basically bring you down to what, 19? Um, so it's pretty bad. Okay. So I want to just show some of the recent work we did very quickly um, on rotation symmetry detection. Can I go back? 
Okay, so this is about finding symmetries. And the interesting thing about this one is instead of looking in the spatial domain, this is actually going for the, uh, the, the frequency domain. However, it's not doing the way that you think it is doing. It's actually figure out where the potential center is and spin around actually each center and it builds this freeze pattern. So basically it's building a relationship between rotation symmetry and the transition symmetry. Okay, so once this, once you just so happen you spin around with a real center, then you will see a pattern really truly freeze or very close to freeze. And then you just go line by line, row by row basically. Then you find the highest frequency, then everybody voting for the same part, then you basically found rotation symmetry. So this is an alternative way of finding rotation symmetry that has not been tried before. And uh, this is actually when my student did this, really tested on lots of images. It's, it's actually amazing to be able to do all this stuff that uh, some of the cactus, is like a 32, 37 of those folds that usually when you count, you got all confused, but automatically we actually can use algorithm like this to figure out uh, very, qu very quickly and accurately. And this idea of relating symmetry, uh, rotation with translation and also relating frequency with spatial domain also turns out to be very robust. Um, so I'm almost done. Okay, then just move forward. And then another thing appear very frequently in nature is the symmetry never, uh, like I said, appear perfectly and lots of natural stuff, just like all this curved stuff out there. And this is another more recent work we have done, basically able to discover all those kind of symmetry axes. It's, it's really not the so-called medial axis at all. I mean, look at this zip, zipper. This, ax, uh, this axis of reflection is way off from the boundaries because it's really after the texture on the, on the body of the, of, the, of the lizard. And this one is a spine image. It turns out there are lots of this kind of images out there for analyze people's um, spine problems or whatever, natural development um, problems. And we, given this kind of method, we actually can quantify what kind of difference and uh, make, help doctors to make diagnosis. Um, well, this is really small, but I just want to point out translation symmetry. So what I've been talking about, remember that initially I showed you what kind of symmetries are there in 2D? You got translation, rotation, reflection, and glide reflection. So pretty much I, the recent stuff we are doing is already done something with rotation and reflection because we generalize reflection as part of glide reflection. And the translation part also, as you can see, it has been evaluated on 260 images and we got about 85% accuracy and the speed up is still 10 times faster than the best algorithm out there. Okay, so basically we now have on a good, uh, the good news is we on a very solid footing, at least we have a pretty much a good idea what's available and what's their capabilities with real patterns. And we have already uh, existing proof that group theory plus statistical learning theory, which I have no time to detailing right now, but um, we have results to show that it works. Um, and of course, we are still challenging with all kinds of disguised and um, layered symmetries. And I would just end here. Um, there are some promise. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. <laughs> Three questions. Okay. Which one? Are you asking about the regularity measurements? Yes. Uh, that lattice. So one place I can I can think of is the, um, we define a pair of regularity measurements and one of them is about the lattice deformation. Right, so 
Right, that's one place we used it to measure the distance, right here. Yes, so basically this show is that the red one is the regular version and the black one is whatever is being deformed to. So those L, M, L, K basically is the diagonal and then this L, I, L, J is the, the two edges. So here basically, because it's a quadrilateral form, then you can take the derivative and you can find the max, min, whatever, then you, you have closed form solution. So this T1, T2 is the regular version that is well defined. But once you find them, you basically just measure th the distance between the corresponding edges. Or oh, why Euclidean distance? Uh, that's a good question. That's the most convenient and most intuitive so far. But certainly I would uh, be uh, open to any other alternative distance, of course, yes. Do you think there is an uh, alternative better one? Oh, okay. Capture. Oh, trying to recognize. Uh, yeah, so that's a deformed version of what it's supposed to be, right? Yes, I would think the, the basic idea would apply, just the, the things there would be actually much more specific. This one we're looking for regularity in very general terms, and that's very specific, like letters or numbers. Yes, I think so, yeah. Uh, a website? A link to this talk. Uh, uh, I don't have one yet, <laughs> but you can email me. Yeah. Well, there's a question over there. Uh, are you, uh, you, you have finished your three questions? Okay, thank you. But I do want to know this distance measure you're talking about later. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's a very interesting question. So the question is about fractals. I've been asked this question like n times also. Uh, uh, that's very interesting. So, okay, so back to math. The definition of symmetry and symmetry groups usually is defined as rigid transformation. The rigid transformation excludes scaling, right? However, of course, this can be extended to beyond rigid. Uh, but so far what we are doing here is following the classic definition of symmetry groups. And of course we allow deformations and all that stuff and that's really go beyond what the math is saying. But that direction is definitely we would ultimately want to go to is the, in the scaling space as well as additional dimension and apply all this. Aperiodic, like a Penrose hiding. Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. <laughs> yeah. Ah, you're saying in this spectrum, so we are still on the near regular side, but there is yet another set that's, that's proven unpredictable, or is it just commented a, as unpredictable? I would love to have that reference, yes. Yeah, but that's definitely somewhere which 
we want to cover the whole spectrum. That's the goal. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, Eric. So that's also, I show some of the results here for um, segmentation. So that's one of the things we are doing already. So the algorithm doing is, um, the first phase of the algorithm is propose, uh, just propose lattices. So what this pr proposition is doing is propose all these T1, T2 generators. And actually, if you look our algorithm like step by step, I don't have the like the first phase what the output is. You you have all these things on each one of the facet, maybe more than one on each one of those. So then, if you enumerate them, then that's what's happening here. Actually, I don't know if you can see in detail. Some of this actually have multiple letters on the same facet. That because in the proposal stage, actually there is more than one proposal, and then there should also uh, kind of follow up stage that is to be able to recognize, although I propose this vector this way, but then another vector actually different. But this ultimately is actually generating the same lattice. And this actually we can do mathematically, there's no, no problem. Uh, algorithmically, basically it's trying to figure out what is the most promising one and started with there, with that, start to expand. So it's basically it's growing a lattice, almost like biologically growing, <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's definitely true. The same pixel can have more than one lattice, um, but the, s the inverse is not true. It's not the same lattice. I mean, as long as it's uh, complete, it, the same lattice cannot cross like different regions of the of the pixel. So the same pixel have the same uh, different lattice. It, it actually can be resolved relatively easily because uh, remember those uh, lattice. Uh, the group stuff we're talking about. Basically, there is a way to find a unique uh, kind of a way of determining, but since we, right now we allow deformation, if you have a rigid form, actually, they'll be very unique, the lattice. And since, because the deformation has multiple lattices, but they actually can be transformed into each, each, into each other. This is basically just different generators. And you can actually verify the, so there should be, which I'm now showing here, a merge process as a post processing, if you will. And then that would be ended up with one set of um, pixels associated with a unique lattice, a agreed upon lattice, basically. Yeah. 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 Um, I think uh, you basically characterize correctly. We're starting from the regular end, so we're pushing towards. And what I have indicated here is like, uh, for example, we started um, with this somewhat regular stuff, and then we're pushing, for example, uh, recently we're dealing with this crowds data. So that's more, I mean, that's maybe as far as we are right now. Uh, towards the more stochastic side of things. And one of the things we do, for example, originally we started with, like, uh, if you give me a picture, I have one piece of lattice. And then with the crowd case, for example, it's, I mean, for this case already it started, like, we can have multiple um, lattices in the same image. So in a crowd case, even in a video frame, in a video, a different frames, we don't necessarily have one simple lattice. You start to have the stochastic behavior of, this lattice is appearing, uh, maybe disappearing next, because people just diverged, go different direction, then they will disappear. And then it may reorganizing, then you may have a new um, uh, lattice. So that kind of behavior will be closer and closer towards how to merge this.
Okay. Um, so, yeah, I I omit one slide somewhere, but let me just draw something. Actually, I, I made. Sorry. So I will show off my tablet also, so I can actually draw something here. So this is actually one of the reasons I well, one of the motivations I I went to. Um, Nips and discussed with um, some of the machine learning people there. Okay, for example, so what if you talk in the Bayesian terms? So what we're really doing here is suppose this is the group, and this is the data we observed, and we can say, okay, we're trying to find this posterior probability. We're trying to determine which group it is. Of course, the things become complicated because I just use F here. The data is deformed, right? And another complication is the group also being deformed in the sense that it may not be the original group, like what we're talking about in the Afan case, for example. So the interesting becomes that if we want to write this out, so this is some kind of normalization term, but if we put this in a complete Bayesian kind of framework, then we're really talking about um, trying to find the likelihood and the prior. Say this is G or AG, whatever. That's the deformation. So what's, what I'm writing here is lots of things actually happening. First of all, we have a very um, strong interest and ongoing work on what do we do with the data. The data itself, actually we have Basically, there is a mapping. It's a feature extraction, so-called. Everybody using different kinds. But this actually makes a big difference from the original data to what kind of symmetry pattern you ended up with. So this is, involves lots of perhaps learning and all kinds of uh, validation, cross-validation stuff. And then for the group side, the deformation, this A, I just read in a very general term, it could be actually a very general group um, I don't know, it's, it's the most general group that means you can do all kinds of deformations with it. And this, basically not like the most group I have talked about, basically it's a discrete group or it's an infinite group, but um, they call finitely generated. But it can be a manifold. So basically it's, it's a Lie group or some kind of, all the possible manipulations you can have on the group. So that can then easily introduce some kind of probability um, function. So basically saying this kind of deformation is more common than the others. And another thing about prior is also, it's actually very interesting by observing um, Atlanta, Georgia images. It turns out for all those high-rise buildings, it's not all kinds of group appear equal, all kinds of symmetry group appear equally likely. We actually observe three kinds appear a lot. I, actually, I really want to talk to some architect, how they design buildings, really. They have certain symmetries. They appear in the building a lot, but others not. So all these places, all this statistical um, statistic, this actually basically involves building a statistical model of if we want to look at buildings or buildings, or if we want to look at a zebra fish, that will be something completely different. But all this is basically can be um, framed in this kind of static learning and the statistics, whatever uh, randomness or, or regularity can be embedded in here. So that's the plan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's basically run out of people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>